Okay. Uh, I see the room is filling up with participants. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jörg Mühlenhoff. I'm the head of the European Energy Transition Program at Heinrich Böll Stiftung here in our EU office in Brussels. Good afternoon. Uh, just to introduce also the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, uh, we are a political foundation affiliated uh, with the German Green Party. Our task is political education and advocacy in Germany and abroad. Uh, this afternoon, um, back on track to Paris, question mark, uh, we will uh, dig for one hour into the details of the post-2030 climate and energy targets for the European Union. Um, two days ago, uh, the European Commission suggested a new target of 90% greenhouse gas emissions reductions by the year 2040. We are four months ahead of the European elections, so this is not just, of course, it's not a legislative proposal, but a very impressive and important uh, proposal coming from the European Commission um, that is decisive also for the future EU climate and energy policy. So there is no doubt about the urgency uh, to continue the EU's uh, pathway towards net zero emissions, towards a renewable energy system. But we, of course, still need to discuss which uh, pathways are the best ones, which are fit for uh, net zero. Will we see a new fit for 55, then maybe a fit for 90 or 95 package in the future? This is what we will discuss. We have invited speakers from the EU institutions, uh, from science, uh, civil society and industry to discuss uh, these challenges and also, of course, the solutions for one hour today. Um, just uh, before starting with a little interactive uh, exercise with you to know you, the audience, uh, and your opinion, uh, some uh, very short housekeeping rules. Um, please use the Q&A box to post your questions. We will try to answer them, be it in the box, uh, be it that we uh, redirect your question then from the box to the speakers afterwards, after the presentations of the panelists. Uh, we are, as you can see, recording uh, this webinar. And uh, we also will try to make the slides available on our website afterwards. You can already uh, consult the fact sheet, uh, the analysis that we have commissioned with Vandal Trio, one of our speakers this afternoon. You can see it uh, downloaded on our website um, to find your way through the maze of numbers uh, all around uh, scenarios and targets. So um, to start, uh, first of all, to get to know your uh, point of view from the audience, uh, we have prepared a little um, poll, a Zoom poll, where you can answer a question. Uh, we can just launch this little pop-up window now, and we would like to know from you, uh, what is the most important hurdle in view of reaching an ambitious 2040 target in the European Union. You can just tick, say, wait, maybe it's the lack of investment security in the industry, or there is a shrinking support from the European Parliament that we cannot reach it, or this is important, or the biggest hurdle is maybe the third option that we have too little progress on renewables uh, and on energy savings, or uh, there is too little progress maybe on carbon removals. Just uh, choose one uh, of these um, boxes uh, and vote. And we, we will see in a few seconds the result, the opinion of our audience today. Okay, and I think you all had enough time to choose and to answer our little opening question as an icebreaker. What is the most important hurdle in view of reaching an ambitious 2040 climate target? Um, maybe we can get the result. Ah, there it is. Um, and yes, quite obviously, first option is ticked most, the lack of investment security in industry. More than half of uh, you think this is uh, what is really uh, most important hurdle. Okay, many thanks for that. So after this first uh, setting the scene um, and an overview of what our audience uh, thinks, um, I would like to hand over to our guest speaker from the European Commission, 
uh, Vicky Pollard. Uh, she's the head of uh, unit um, for foresight, economic analysis and modeling at the European Commission's uh, Directorate General for Climate Action, uh, DG Klima. Um, for those who have not yet had the time to read the 605 impressive pages of uh, scenarios and modeling, maybe Vicky, uh, you can uh, give us an overview of the most important elements of uh, this communication and uh, what you suggest as the way uh, forward uh, towards net zero and for 2040. Just um, start your camera and um, switch to your presentation. Thank you. The floor is yours. I'm trying to start my video. Okay, I can start my video. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I will share my screen um, so that you see the presentation. Can you see that okay? It's showing good, good, good. Very good, thank you. Let me remove the top part. Um, Not um, cooperating with removing the top part. <laughs> I apologize for that. But I hope you can see enough of the. Uh, hang on. Yes. We tried to sort this problem earlier, but anyway, we. Um, okay. Can I do it without? Yeah, if, if you cannot remove the top part, uh, let's just start. Uh, your slide is visible. Okay. <laughs> you can see. So screen. basically, the, the, which is the title that you can't see uh, says it's uh, the need to go for, for ambitious global action. Um, and I think where we start from, obviously, is that uh, we've just come out of, uh, well, we're still in, <laughs> with the, the warmest uh, year, uh, 2023, 1.48 eight. Uh, degrees warming, 1.48. Uh, a new story today with Copernicus saying that we are now over 1.5 degrees uh, warming. Climate change is intensifying um, and the costs of climate change are growing exponentially, so really accelerating. Um, and that sets the scene for this communication, the need uh, to cut greenhouse gases uh, sharply and rapidly and to prepare for the impacts of climate change as set out by the IPCC in the sixth assessment report. Um, it also comes um, against the context of the COP28, the global stock take, and the minimum expectations set um, at COP28 by the parties, um, which indicate that the world is moving towards the path taken by the EU uh, towards climate neutrality um, and uh, just transition. Um, the communication uh, is um, sets out a vision, a comprehensive vision, and as you said, it's a big impact assessment, it's very comprehensive, but the communication is very clear that this is about the vision for the EU beyond 2030, which is about the opportunities for the EU in terms of investments. The poll showed uh, the focus, the need for investment, and this is really about creating um, the opportunities for investment that goes in the right direction, for quality jobs, but also a strong industrial ecosystem. It's about leading the development of clean tech markets for the future, so setting out where we can be in terms of maintaining or keeping a lead um, in terms of clean tech, uh, manufacturing jobs um, and economic opportunities. It's about um, ensuring clean, uh, affordable energy, sustainable food and materials, and that's in particular important in terms of resilience. We set out a vision clearly for resilience from uh, the impacts of climate change, but also resilience in terms of strengthened strategic autonomy, um, and given the uh, very important costs, um, for example, of fossil fuel imports, in 2022, I think we were at 4.4% of GDP um, in terms of the cost of fossil fuel imports. It was down to 2.4% in 
2023, but still, this is uh, very important um, in terms of uh, energy security and uh, the strategic autonomy of the EU economy. Um, but also clearly maintaining our position as a global leader and a trusted partner in terms of climate action with, um, with our partners around the world. The 2040 target communication, um, what it does do is set out an assessment on the pathway towards climate neutrality and along that pathway provides a recommended target for 2040. So it shows us what a good pathway can look like. It also uh, looks at the enabling conditions to reach that recommended target. And it's about launching a dialogue that will inform the next commission, both in terms of putting forward a legal proposal for the 2040 target, and in terms of ensuring that the post 2030 framework is sufficient to meet that 2040 target and the wider uh, vision um, set out in the communication. So what this um, communication does not do, it's not about uh, a legal proposal for a target, it's a recommended target. It's not about uh, sectoral um, targets. Um, it's um, not about changing the uh, 2030 framework. The 2030 framework remains as it is um, because um, you know, we, we're now full in implementation and we need to meet the 2030 target to um, reduce the greenhouse gas budget that we're using up um, to minimize the greenhouse gas um, or the drawdown by the EU on the greenhouse gas budget globally. Also very important, of course, is that the uh, 2040 target will be the basis for the EU's new NDC. That new NDC needs to be submitted by 2025. The communication, it comes now because of, as we mentioned before, the important uh, cost of inaction, the important cost of inaction in terms of um, uh, climate inaction. So we estimate, uh, you'll see in the impact assessment, we have an estimation, we have a big section on the cost of inaction. We did some macroeconomic work, which of course, um, is quite conservative, but suggests that uh, if we weren't to take the action to be on 1.5 de uh, degrees, the cost to the economy could be a 7% reduction of GDP by uh, the end of the century. That's excluding uh, the cost of loss of life. We don't uh, value the, the loss of life. Um, it also does not take account of impacts of climate tipping points. And we know that uh, without rapid action now, we're increasing the risk of breaching um, very damaging, potentially damaging climate tipping, point, tipping points. It's important now because we need to plan for the transition. Um, authorities, uh, businesses, investors are making decisions now to meet the 2030 targets. It's essential that those decisions are taken with a full of good knowledge of a full knowledge of what we need to do post 2030 so that we don't uh, waste resources so that we don't invest in future stranded assets um, that we make sure that the scarce resources that we do have are well invested um, for uh, the benefit of all Europeans so business and for fair, fair transition so this is about predictability for investments um, predictability for, for all types of decisions. And of course, what we're doing is responding to the European climate law. We have a legal obligation to come forward with a proposal within uh, six months of the global stock take. Um, obviously, we have elections coming up. And so the legal proposal will come after the elections. But we it's very important that um, the information is there to feed into a debate. The... Um, and so this communication is about launching a debate, um, both uh, a strategic political debate, but a broad debate um, and dialogue with stakeholders. Um, and the Commission had a dialogue last week um, with the an agricultural dialogue. But of course, there's a longstanding um, system of social dialogue um, and dialogues um, been taking place over the last few months with industry 
this is, you know, this is the right time to have this information out here. The communication itself is based um, on the scientific advice, so the latest scientific advice. We, we use the IPCC um, heavily, as does the European Scientific, Board, scientific, scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change. The um, communication um, is consistent with that advice. It draws on the advice of the ESABCC. And it also draws on, as you said, the 605 pages of impact assessment um, which uh, presented here, people might find it hard. It takes a, I don't suggest you, you print it. It's easier to look on screen because it's a pretty heavy in terms of uh, all the material inside. Um, the, in terms of the target, so the assessments um, provides us with uh, indications of what is a good, uh, the, the, a good pathway um, and we recommend a target of 90% net greenhouse gas reduction compared to 1990 levels for 2040. Um, and the analysis shows that um, to meet this target, the remaining gross greenhouse gas emissions in the EU should be less than 850 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent in 2040. And the assessment also indicates that carbon removals, and that's both land-based and industrial removals should reach up to 400 million tons of CO2. And that's simply because uh, we know that there will be um, emissions left in hard to abate sectors, which will need to be covered by those removals. But of course, alongside this, there is also uh, a communication on industrial carbon management um, on the um, looks uh, that looks at uh, industrial uh, capture. Um, uh, so there's additional information alongside this. The recommended target leads to an indicative greenhouse gas budget for 2030 to 2050 of 16 gigatons of CO2 equivalents. Um, and uh, if we look at what we did in terms um, of the assessment, so uh, we looked, this is the 2040 target assessment, uh, what we looked at in terms of the pathway to climate neutrality. And, and we assessed, um, actually we looked at five different target options, but the ones we retained for detailed assessment, ones which, which um, weren't um, rejected early on because they weren't compatible um, with climate neutrality or, or other aspects of the, the, the legislation that we have. Um, are three target options, and these target options all start from the same starting point in 2030, so where we need to be in 2030, and uh, reach climate neutrality in 2050, as you can see here um, in the, the uh, graph here on the, on the screen. Um, and we looked at um, a net greenhouse gas reduction target of 80% um, by 2040, um, a target option of 85 to 90% in 2040, um, which um, um, which is probably as closest to, to, to where we would be with the full implementation of uh, the existing legal provisions post-2030, um, where there are legal provisions, and then a target option um, of 90, at least 90, Present to 95% in 2040. So that's the full range that we looked at in terms of detailed assessment. Um, and from that, um, we uh, the preferred option, and you can see the impact assessment sets out in a lot of detail why we selected option three as the preferred option, which gives us 90% to 95%, and which is the basis for the 90% um, recommended target. First of all, um, because it is the only one of the target options that corresponds with the European Scientific Advisory Board's advice on the target and the greenhouse gas budget. And so it's the only one which is in line, therefore, with the European climate law and with our commitments under the Paris Agreement. It's uh, the one that brings, brings us the greatest benefits in terms of energy independence, in terms of strategic autonomy, and in a volatile world 
protecting us against fossil fuel price shocks in the future. Um, it is uh, the option that leads to the fastest investment in novel low carbon technology deployment. So it does require new technologies such as hydrogen production using electrolyzers, uh, DAX, BEX, to be implemented or that investment to come in sooner. So more investments in the first decade. Um, but that's also uh, important in terms um, of the domestic market we're creating for clean tech and the what it means for the EU's industrial base and how we are placed in terms of the global clean technology race. And I think clearly after the COP um, in Dubai, it's clear that with um, all countries seeking to um, move in this direction and the competition for the clean tech markets, this is incredibly important. The um, important to note, um, the investment needs are similar ac across all the target options when you look over the two decades. So from 2031 to 2050, there's very slight differences, but not big differences between the different target options. However, what you see because of uh, the faster action, the acceleration of action um, to reach uh, a higher uh, reduction in 2040 under option three, that um, some of the energy system investments are brought forward uh, to 2030 to 2040. Um, and that means that the um, investment costs are slightly higher in uh, option three for the first decade, but then they're uh, correspondingly lower in the second decade. So they give you savings in terms of investment in 2041 to 2050. Um, by front loading, of course, there are moderately higher raw material needs, 2031 to 2040, but again, less 2041 to 2050, but they're moderately higher than the other options. Um, and of course, there's a big push now to address the critical raw materials that's necessary whichever option I think we, we go for. Um, and important to say that the energy system costs are similar also across all the options in 2031 to 2040. Um, the advantage also of option three is that the fossil fuel import costs fall significantly under option, say here, but as option three. So this is the first time we do this presentation. So we, you're our testing ground, <laughs> we we'll see a few typos. Um, but uh, it means that, you know, from uh, the level we were at in 20, uh, a couple of years ago, we go down to 1.4% of GDP uh, for the import costs in 2040, and then very quickly down to 0.6% in the last decade. Um, but of course, um, while the, the differences in costs and the differences in investment between options um, are not important, um, overall, the um, it's, it remains important to put more investment into the just transition because, of course, some sectors will uh, be impacted and some people will be impacted more than others. It's a very brief summary because I don't have much time. <laughs> There's a lot more detail in the impact assessment and I um, suggest you go and have a look at that. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the, climate, the global context is essential. Um, the what happened at COP shows um, the um, commitment that's coming from all uh, countries to move in this direction. The in particular the tripling of global renewable energy capacity, the doubling of energy efficiency improvements by the end of this decade, the the shifting uh, uh, down of fossil fuels. Um, all all mean that um, it's important uh, that. Uh, we stay the course in the EU, but it's also uh, important that we expand our global cooperation and we're committed to strengthening our climate diplomacy. The climate and fi finance remains important, of course, the partnerships and strengthening those partnerships and leading by example, because uh, over the years, the, the, um, the contribution that the EU provides also in terms of technology, in terms of showing the example, in terms of governance, in terms of policies, in terms of building the confidence that other countries can do this because we provided the example is very, very important. And one area which is mentioned in particular um, in the communication 
is um, to develop, to work on the global approach to carbon prices, to intensify um, the carbon market diplomacy, and there will be a creation of a carbon markets task force um, to allow the, the staff and resources to be provided to partners to help them in developing robust um, domestic carbon markets um, of their own to help them implement their, their NDCs and their commitments. And of course, uh, the implementation of CBAN uh, continues. And may I ask you, sorry to interrupt, but uh, yeah. as the 15 minutes um, slot is already over to okay. <laughs> Uh, wrap so, up and summarize during the next uh, one minute. Is that okay? So uh, just very quickly, the um, the communication uh, emphasizes five enabling conditions which are necessary to go to the 2040 targets. So clearly, full implementation of the 2030 targets, climate and energy targets. The necessity to have a competitive European industry, and you will see that the um, there's a strong emphasis on the Green Deal being uh, an industrial decarbonization deal and uh, the, the need to, there to also create the investment, the criteria needed for investment, a big investment agenda, both for industry, but also um, for infrastructure and, for, um, and there the use of good use of public finance to de-risk um, and to attract more private finance. Um, the importance in that context also of a level playing field with international partners. You'll notice in the communication, the first of the areas we focus on in terms of um, um, delivering on the 2040 target is the focus on just transition, because as the, the communication says, people are at the center of the, the, the transition, and this is a transition for people. Um, so there's a lot of focus there also on the just transition. And uh, to say that this is opening a dialogue and a debate um, on the post-2030 framework. Um, very quickly, um, in terms of the structure, and I haven't, I'm not going to go through it, but these are the, the main sections you will find in the communication. Um, we talk about what it means for the different sectors, obviously a decarbonized um, um, energy system, um, what, what's happened to, to the electricity system, where the fossil fuels remain, um, it's really for aviation, um, a bit of balancing um, for industrial uses um, of, um, uh, of uh, fossil fuels, it's gas and oil. Um, decarbonization of transport and mobility, the contribution that the land sector and agriculture provides for our food, for our nature, as well as for the emissions reductions um, and the, the importance of this investment agenda, which is really important. Um, there are eight building blocks mentioned in the annex. I won't go through them, but they pick up some of the big points from the text, from that section four, about the things that are needed in terms of the enabling framework about, for delivering 2040. Um, and to say this is obviously about securing prosperity and well-being um, of the current and future generations. It's about demonstrating our determination, both in terms of uh, industrial policy, our, our role in clean tech, um, in terms of the, the industrial revolution, which is happening now. Um, not to mention, I wish we mentioned, but secular economy and dematerialization are very important too, um, and the bioeconomy. Um, but very much also a signal to the rest of the world about our commitment to the Paris Agreement, about our commitment to multilateral action, uh, pro and providing the example and the means for others to act too. Thanks a lot. Many thanks for this um, very detailed overview of this even more detailed uh, assessment, this impact assessment and the communication. We will, um, of course, still have time for questions later. I invite participants uh, to use uh, the Q&A box, uh, but uh, I will immediately now hand over uh, for um, the first reaction from uh, Wendel Trio. Uh, we uh, asked Wendel uh, already in last year to analyze the current state of targets. Uh, are we on track? No, we are definitely not. And Wendel will also take a step back, looking into what still we need to do in terms of homework for 2030. 
And you can uh, maybe just share your slides. Uh, many people in the room know Wendel. Uh, he's an independent uh, consultant working on energy and climate policy now, but he has been in uh, leading positions with Greenpeace and Climate Action Network Europe uh, in the past 20 years. Over to you, Wendel. Thank you. I'm... Okay, can you see my Yes. Yes, good. Thanks. So, uh, first of all, Jörg, thank you for the invitation to say a few words. I will try to keep it short. As uh, Jörg already mentioned, um, there is more information in the fact sheet that can be downloaded from the website of the Böll Foundation. Um, as Vicky already mentioned, there is a, a, a real urgency on climate change and the cost of inaction will be large. So I will uh, give you a little bit of a complementary um, approach to uh, what uh, the Commission is be, has been proposing um, just uh, the day before yesterday. But before I start about the post-2030 framework, let me just remind you that 2030 or what we do until now, uh, till 2030, is still extremely important and we're still facing an enormous emissions gap. This is from the latest uh, UN Environment Programs emissions gap report. We we have an emo enormous emissions gap to the two degrees target of the past, but also to the 1.5 degrees target of the Paris Agreement. And the gap is both in terms of pledges, but even greater in terms of implementation, as also implementation is still an issue that also goes for the EU. Uh, member states have not um, uh, been fully on track of implementing all the elements of the Fit for, Fit for 55, as also evidenced by the latest um, assessment of the national energy and climate plans by the Commission. So extremely important, not for today, but extremely important that we keep in mind that what happens between now and 2030 will probably be even more decisive for uh, our future climate than what happens after 2030. That's one thing. Secondly, um, it's important to note that there are actually two different processes that are relevant for the debate about post-2030. One is the Paris Agreement um, and the five-year timeframes, the five-year cycle that the Paris Agreement has created. And out of that, and this is from the latest uh, decision or the latest uh, conference of the parties in Dubai, out of that, um, all countries in the world are requested to present their tar new targets for 2035 um, at latest nine to 12 months before um, COP30, which takes place in Brazil in November 2025. So in principle, by early 2025, all countries should put new targets for, by early 2025, countries should put new targets for 2035 on the table. And then there's obviously uh, what has already been said, the EU climate law, uh, that uh, obliges the Commission to come up with a proposal for a new 2040 target. Why are these two processes important? Um, of course, there's a difference in, in the time frame, but that's not the most important element. The most, most important is that they actually create two different frameworks. One is the framework um, from the European climate law that the European Commission has used, but also the scientific advisory board, which um, clearly says in the impact assessment that the proposal for a 2030, for 2040 target is within the framework of reaching net zero by 2050. The um, UN process actually looks at targets that al are aligned with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, which is the target from the Paris Agreement. And these are not the same. Net zero 2050 and aligning with 1.5 is not equal. And that's what I want to show in my next uh, slides. So how do we define what 1.5 means? Um, there's many different ways of doing so, but the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in its latest assessment report, uh, the sixth assessment report, has um, created a table of the remaining 
carbon budgets. Remaining carbon budgets means that scientists have actually found that there's a direct relationship between the emissions, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the rise in temperature. And so they have said that from 2020 onwards, for having a decent chance to limit temperature rise to 1.5, the world can still emit around 400 gigatons of CO2. That's for a 67% chance of, uh, of limiting temperature rise to uh, 1.5. That's not a high likelihood. 67% is fine if it's about your uh, exams, but it might not be fine if it's about the future of your children and grandchildren. So, uh, but this is what usually is being used, 400 gigatons left. Now, that's for the world. So the question mark is then, how do we divide that across different countries? And there are many ways of doing so. And the advice, scientific advisory board has looked into that and they looked at different elements. One way is let's divide the remaining budget across the population. So each country would get a share that is similar to the share of the global population. Others say, well, no, within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, countries have actually committed to what is called equity, and equity then refers to common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities, meaning countries that have emitted more in the past should take up that responsibility and thus should emit less in the future. Secondly, countries that have that are richer, that have higher GDPs, should also emit emit less in the future. And if you take that into account, you see here different approaches that have been looked at by the scientific advisory board. Um, and the more you take into account historical emissions, the more you take into account GDP, or even when you take into account consumption-based emissions, the smaller the budget becomes to an almost um, inexistent uh, remaining budget for the European Union. So from that, um, different approaches have been uh, made. And in general, it is said, let's use the equal per capita approach to define domestic EU budget. And let's use historical emissions and uh, GDP capacity, et cetera, to identify financial contributions that richer countries that have emitted more in the past should make to developing countries. So we'll use the equal per capita approach. Let me, and this becomes very technical, so I'm going to go extremely fast here, but the global carbon budget from the IPCC is really about CO2 emissions. Now, EU policy and the um, carbon budget from both the Scientific Advisory Board and the Commission is about greenhouse gas emissions. So that needs to be uh, transposed from CO2 to greenhouse gases. And then we have a budget of around 550 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. EU population between 2050 and as projected, 20, between 2020 and projected 2050 would be a bit more than 5%, 5.07%. If you calculate that 5.07% from a global CO2 equivalent budget of 550, you get a budget for the EU that is an equal per capita greenhouse gas budget of around 27 and a half. Uh, gigatons of CO2 for the period 2020 to 2050. So let's take that um, uh, amount into um, our consideration. Then we have looked at several potential scenarios or existing scenarios and looked what the impact are. And I'll quickly run through the scenario. One is the fit for 55 uh, scenario, which is actually a um, a linear reduction from 2030 uh, minus 55 to net zero in 2050. It corresponds to the scenario one of the commission communication <clears throat> and the impact assessment. The second one is the kind of low end of the uh, proposals from the strategic advisory board, which more or less corresponds to the option three and the preferred option uh, that is in the commission communication. It's the same as before, minus 55 net zero, but going through minus 90 in uh, 2040. Then the advice of the Strategic Advisory Board also had some other numbers. They said that 
um, moving to minus 70% reductions in 2030 would be um, much more or would increase the fairness of the EU's approach. And they also um, recommended uh, minus 95% reductions by 2040 as the upper end um, of their advice. So that's the third scenario that we looked at. The fourth scenario is the remind scenario. It's actually um, a transposition of the global remind scenario by climate analytics in their report on um, 1.5 compatible pathways for the EU. Um, this scenario goes over um, a minus 71% reduction in 2030 and minus 97% reduction in 2040. And then the fifth one we've looked at is the Paris Agreement compatible scenario that has been developed by European NGOs, um, which uh, goes over a minus 65% gross emission reduction by 2030, net zero by 2040, and a strong increase of removals, nature-based removals to 600 million ton uh, by 2030 and being stable until 2050. So that's very briefly those five scenarios that give this kind of graph <clears throat> You see how the different uh, scenarios relate to each other. Of course, um, as um, as indicated, with um, three scenarios that foresee a much uh, stronger reduction already in 2030, and you see a very sharp um, increase after 2025, because we've assumed that up to 2025 the policies would not be changed. We're already. Uh, early 2024, so it's uh, it would be a bit uh, unrealistic to assume that. Now, that doesn't need to be, it looks here, a very radical uh, drop after 2025, but taking into account, and that's that very little square um, <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the left, that's where actual emissions in 2022 are. They are way below the um, allocated emission allowances under ETS and ESR. So it looks uh, very sharp after 2025, but if we're assuming that emissions in the EU continue to drop, we might be on that pathway um, anyway. Secondly, the um, most ambitious scenario, um, the PAC scenario after going uh, to net zero goes well below into net negative emissions that is due to the high amount of uh, nature-based removals. Also, that uh, may sound relatively unrealistic because as opposed to renewables energy efficiency where progress is being made, unfortunately, at the moment, we actually see nature-based removals uh, going down rather than going up. And that's an important problem in particular for some of the most forested countries in the European Union that really need to change um, course there. So those are the five uh, graphs and taking account of time. Um, so then looking at the, the results, we see that um, if we're taking into account that our 1.5 compatible equal, equal per capita share budget is 27.5, then only the PAC scenario comes close to that. Um, the remind scenario would have a 35 gigatons budget, which more or less corresponds to a 50% chance for uh, 1.5 and the uh, strategic advisory board or the commission's preferred proposal would have a total budget for 2020 to 2050 of around 46 gigatons, which would compare to a 33% of uh, reaching uh, or limiting temperature rise uh, to 1.5. The Just for the numbers, the PAC scenario would foresee minus 94% net reductions in 2035 and minus 104 in 2040. So that's uh, substantial uh, different numbers and 100% renewable energy also uh, by 2040. Again, I'm going very quickly through this, but the number of observations coming from this uh, scenario, one, net zero 2050 um, is actually not aligned with an equitable 1.5 pathway with a decent chance um, of, of achieving that. And actually that has also been um, confirmed by a study that was made for the um, uh, scientific advisory board, but has not been reflected in their final advice. And you see two graphs here where people from, uh, scientists from IASA have looked at both <clears throat> the Fit for 55 pathway, as well as the PAC pathway. And so the, the vertical line that you see in the two graphs is where the budget 
uh, the equal per capita budget actually um, ends and everything that is to the right of that vertical line is the overshoot of the budget. And you see that with minus 55 and net zero 2050, there's a substantial overshoot of the equal per capita budget, while with minus 65 and net zero 2040, that would fit kind of within the budget. So it's actually um, not uh, something that is uh, out of line with the um, science opinions. A second observation, um, the in, in the run-up to COP28 in Dubai of, of late last year, the Environment Council made a number of um, recommendations in its council conclusions that we're not really seeing in this proposal. First of all, the council asked for a significant acceleration of action. What the commission is proposing, and as they say it itself, it would go from a business as usual minus 88% to 90%. That doesn't really fit my definition of acceleration. Secondly, the EU has been calling for a global phase out of fossil fuels. There is no phase out date in the communication. It has called for a decarbonization of the global power system in the 2030s, while the EU's power system would only be uh, decarbonized in 2040. So it's a little bit strange to see that difference um, um, in, in approach there. And finally, um, the lawmakers, when they asked um, for the Commission to come up with their proposal six months after the global stock take, obviously wanted to make a connection between the global stock take and the proposal from the Commission, but we're missing some of the recommendations of this global stock take, like the tripling of renewable energy, the doubling of energy efficiency, the phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies, or the halting and reversing of, for the EU relevant, forest degradation. All of those are not being mentioned as EU targets within the communication, while it could as well perfectly have been done because nothing of this um, has been uh, very new. Um, it's, 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 it's a pity that the Commission communication doesn't make use of the recommendations of the global stock take to show the world how the EU is already um, looking at those recommendations and starting to implement them. I will leave it there and thank you. Thank you very much, Wendel. Um, you mentioned the lawmakers. Uh, it's now up to the European Parliament, and we have a member of the European Parliament, Michael Bloss um, from the German Green Party, who is sitting in the Industry and Energy Committee in the Parliament, who has a lot of experience uh, in, in this area, and he will uh, now give us his view in his first reaction. He was already commenting two days ago in the Parliament on the Commission's um, proposal so um please michael why why is this proposal not sufficient from your side <laughs> um thank you very much uh, for the invitation and hello everyone um uh, fortunately also sitting in the environmental committee where i was um, also dealing with the first climate law um so it's nice to see that some of the things that we put in the climate law we are now discussing and that there is a follow-up so, um, I mean, Wendell has already uh, uh, I mean, explained uh, quite well how, um, how I mean, th this is not uh, sufficient with, uh, with the current state of, um, um, of science and, um, and understanding that we have just had already crossed uh, 1.5. It's, it's also a bit weird to, th to speak about that we will have a, a 1.5 compatible, compatible pathway that would actually only have climate neutrality in 2050. Um, let me just be uh, brief, um, and because when it has said many things, I think um, the scientific advisory board just said, I mean, they recommended 90 to 95%. Um, in the beginning, we were at, at least 90%. Now the commission came up with 90%. But one thing I want to really put straight, uh, um, the commission now also said that they're in line with the um, uh, greenhouse gas budget that the scientific advisory board recommended, but that's not true. <laughs> Um, the scientific advisory board recommended 14 uh, gigatons uh, max, um, and now they're at 16 gigatons. Um, so um, so th there is a difference. Um, let me say, secondly, also, I mean, there was, uh, uh, well, in, in this political um, climate currently, we have lots of questions. Is that actually not too, um, too ambitious? Uh, the 90% the commission itself has in its um, impact assessment said that with um, current policies, 
um, we will, would already go to an 88% reduction uh, by the year 2040. So the additional ambition is 2%, um, which I don't think it's, it is it is very uh, ambitious. And we also see that uh, many places have uh, more ambitious um, 2040 targets. Uh, for instance, the state of Bavaria governed by uh, right-wing <laughs> Uh, parties wants to become climate neutral by the year 2040. Also, by the way, Baden-Württemberg, where I'm from. Um, also important, um, as, as um, we were talking about um, uh, investors' decision and um, and signals coming from, from this report, there, and, and it was said already, the, I mean, the, the big thing in Dubai was to have a statement that we phase out of fossils um, and that should also be a signal to, I mean, to to business all around the world. And this signal is not inside this communication, and it's really, I mean, it's really an omission um, that there's nothing in this direction. And you could have the feeling it goes in actually the other direction because if you look into how what they did, basically they just took the baseline scenario and um, took everything that uh, the the um, member states have submitted in the national energy and climate plans. Um, and uh, and on top of that, they have CCS, um, but CCS is not the end of fossils. It is just continuing fossils um, with a technology that is not developed. Um, um, uh, even in the energy sector, we see, and that's, I think, the most problematic part of it, um, that they plan with CCS in the energy sector, not only for, um, um, for bioenergy, um, but also for uh, for fossil gas and uh, or fossil coal. I mean, it's it's not very it's not specified. Ten percent um, CCS. Um, whereas beforehand it was basically clear that I mean we probably need CCS for the um, hard to abate uh, technologies like uh, uh, um, concrete, but not for the energy sector because here we have the solutions. We have wind and sun renewables, we have the flexibility, um, uh, we have uh, backup um, with possibly uh, green hydrogen, but um, but uh, giving, like allowing for CCS. And that of course means also that a lot of now oil and fossil companies want to come up and say, oh, but then you need to also give up more funding for uh, research on CCS. It's just a continuation of, of burning fossil fuels. And and it's really, <laughs> it's it's really unbelievable how that, that kind of, you know, zombie technology is now coming back um, and uh, and should be used to decarbonize, decarbonize the power sector. Also, um, the 2035 target. The assumption now is that um, that there is the the it's a straight line the um, the pathway from 2030 um, to 2040. Um, um, and I think it doesn't really well. It doesn't really comply with um, with the idea of like. Uh, um, picking the the low hanging fruits first, um, politically. Even though I have to say, let's say, well, half a year ago, with the political climate, with the conservatives being very much, um, well, turning against climate policies and also um, mobilizing against this, um, we did not ex well half a year ago. I wouldn't have expected that they would come out with a ninety percent target and that the um, conservative um, and the EPP in the parliament are not um, uh, cri well are not uh, saying that they are going against it no I mean they haven't they have said oh this ambitious and so on but they didn't say oh we want a lower target and I think that's uh, because um, uh, we have a new climate commissioner Hoekstra um, which uh, we only um, um, voted um, on the condition that he would propose a target that is in line with the uh, with the scientific advisory board, and he had to. I mean, he proposed the, the lowest possible, um, uh, but he the, he's from the EPP and he had to, and also uh, Ursula von der Leyen um, uh, signed off on this. So that's good news because that also means in in this possible case that von der Leyen is continuing. She it's it will be hard for her at least. We can criticize her very much if she goes then against um, the target that she has been already um, supporting. So that's that's good. Um, until now, we also see social democrats and liberals being in favor, or even wanting to have some more. So I think the the fight in the next uh, parliament it will be one of the first laws 
um, um, it's it's there. And remembering the last battle around the climate uh, law, we managed that the uh, parliament uh, went more ambitious than uh, the commission with sixty uh, percent until twenty um, uh, thirty. Let's see where we land there. It will be very difficult, of course, but the elections are also not. Bad. I think what is what is what is really interesting and most important is like if we look, think about the national legislation. So, commission will you know will be elected, will come up with their work plan. So that one of the first thing is to have the reform of the climate law where they set the twenty forty target. But then afterwards, um, they will come with the implementation um, legislation like we had the um, fit for fifty five um, package. So this will continue the post 2030 and climate architecture will be there. Um, and, uh, and and this will be very interesting how this would look like. And if you now look into the impact assessment, I think, I mean, they, well, some, one of the sectors that of course is the, is, is the least um, decarbonized is the agricultural sector. They took out the target because they, I think were afraid um, uh, on the, of the current um, debate, but still this has to be tackled. Um, 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 and and there is a, a huge debate about an industrial decarbonization deal. And I think which is really interesting and really important. However, if you look at what they now did is also here, they, they it was not so much about the transformation policies, circularity, but a lot about um, um, CCS. And this is not the only solution. So one of the things that we will have to do is really to, to, to dismantle this whole CCS uh, myth um, because it's, I mean, it basically it it is not yet existing. Yeah, we do not have CCS that can capture one hundred percent of CO two. It's very cost um, uh, intensive. It's very energy intensive, um, and there are other ways um, in the power sector. Definitely the renewables, but also in the um, in the um, in the industry sector, um, um, new um, technologies, hydrogen, um, circularity, um, and. And we have to really have this conversation, how should this should um, look like. Um, May I just uh, pick you at this point uh, with regards to not only the time, but also the solutions that you mentioned. We have indeed uh, still fourth panelist um, from those industries that provide the solutions, alternatives to CCS uh, to being dependent on fossil fuels. It's uh, Naomi Chevilla from Solar Power Europe. I suggest uh, just to close. Uh, this panel that we give uh, Naomi uh, the opportunity to quickly react also on the targets and then uh, finalize uh, with a closing round uh, with all participants, if that is okay. So Naomi, the floor is yours. Your, uh, Naomi is the head of regulatory affairs at uh, Solar Power Europe, uh, the industry federation of the solar photovoltaic industry here in Brussels. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jörg and, and Sonny Michael for uh, taking the floor from you. Uh, it's a bit short to react, but uh, indeed we're, we're quite happy to, uh, and we welcome the, the 2040 strategy that the European Commission has put forward, the high uh, climate objectives, uh, but we still think that there is a lot uh, to do still, a lot to discuss and a number of elements to, to correct, and that's why the next uh, dialogues will be will be very important. Um, I agree with what has been said before. Um, a couple of quick points. Uh, I mean, maybe five quick points. Uh, the, the first one is that uh, in terms of renewable energy objectives, we do see in the strategy that uh, that the uh, the renewables are growing uh, more and more and are the, the cornerstone of the electricity system. But in fact, we can do more uh, with our, we are engaging our own uh, 2040 uh, modeling of the electricity system with Artelis. We're going to release a report in March. Um, and we already see that uh, we could, with the really business as usual scenario, uh, have 1.6 terawatt of solar PV installed by 2040, roughly, uh, which is uh, much lower than the uh, two, I mean, it, which which means that solar would take a big part of the 2.3 uh, terawatt of, um, of renewables foreseen in this scenario. I think the second thing that the, uh, the, 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 the strategy shows is the real importance of grid infrastructure and flexibility in investing into uh, gas and power and hydrogen ready uh, infrastructure. 
And when I say hydrogen ready infrastructure, I mean uh, for purely hydrogen and not for blending, um, but also a flexibility. Uh, we do we do think that uh, the choices that we will make on uh, on how we design the grid, how we deploy the grid, and how much flexibility we deploy will really make or break uh, the energy transition. Um, and that goes, of course, together with a smart electrification, which is also foreseen in the in the uh, strategy. I think we're already past the time. I had other uh, elements to share, but we've uh, we've reacted uh, also on, on our website and I'd be happy to, to continue the, the discussion uh, offline. Thank you very much, uh, Naomi, also for being uh, short and concise. Um, indeed, there are alternatives uh, to uh, carbon capture and storage, um, keeping fossils uh, in the mix. Uh, you don't necessarily need uh, those technologies for, flex for flexibility. There is also uh, demand side response and other options uh, so that um, the fossils combined with CCS might not necessarily play such a an important role. Um, we still have uh, one question in uh, the Q&A box. Um, maybe I can direct this question either to um, uh, Vicky or to uh, maybe Michael, if you want to answer, um, I will read it out shortly. Uh, should future emission reduction ambitions better be linked to conditionality, namely conditions so as to prevent further loss of social coherence? It is a bit broad as a question, but maybe, I mean, there is, a, of course, a just transition element that is quite strong in your communication. Okay, so I think, first of all, I don't think climate action can be, um, uh, it's a choice between one or the other. I think in the absence of climate action, uh, I think we, the social impacts would be enormous and there'd be a loss of social coherence. I think that if you're looking at the sort of scale of change we're looking at, if we have don't act on climate change and if the EU doesn't show the example and encourage others to act, um, I think is uh, would be counterproductive. In terms specifically the, the ETS, um, the cap for the ETS is the guarantee that um, we avoid the worst impacts of climate change, but it's also the cap um, which determines ultimately, uh, along with the demand, of course, the supply and the demand, but the price for carbon, and that um, determines revenues. And the, the ETS is an important source of revenues, both for innovation in industry driving down the cost of transition, and with ETS2 will be a very important source of funds for member states to use to address um, the most uh, needs of the most vulnerable households and uh, micro uh, industries. And I think that's really important in terms of supporting the transition, but also helping the, the most vulnerable to improve their quality of life. Um, I don't know if you want me to come back on other questions, but maybe... Um, <laughs> I see we do not have uh, any questions in the Q&A box anymore, and we do not have any time left. It is already uh, half past five, so we need to uh, close maybe with a very short last uh, reaction from the panelists that are still in the room. Uh, Michael said he had to leave for another appointment. Uh, maybe Vicky, Naomi, Vandal, if you quickly uh, can say, looking into the next uh, legislative term after European elections, what is the most important thing to do in view of the new climate target? What should the Parliament and the Commission do as the first thing? If you have one buzzword, I mean, Vicky, I know you have a lot of things on your agenda and on your to-do list for sure. But uh, just to summarize this, maybe Naomi, ladies, first, do you want to start? Yes, I, uh, for me, I think it will really be about implementation. Uh, I know it's not a nice words to, to hear, but I, I really st stress the importance of grids because we can develop and manufacture as many uh, clean technologies as we want, but if they're not connected or if they have to connect with standards in 27 uh, member states, uh, we'll, we'll have a problem, we'll have a problem of competitiveness. And the issue is that grids are national, sometimes they're very local. So finding a way for the commission to monitor all of that will be very important, but we've done that. We've done that with roads when we needed to get our trucks circulating around Europe. And we went very local, looking at that very locally, also mobilizing tools like the European semester to monitor this kind of thing. So that's where I, I would like to uh, see uh, developments and new ideas. 
great. Many thanks. Um, but then move over to you, or, or yeah, Vicky, do you want to react okay. directly? Maybe just very quickly to say from my side to stay stay the course, um, and that means pushing forward an implementation on 2030, but it means obviously the 2040 target, which is necessary to, uh, um, for the implementation of 2030, but also to ensure that we have the enabling conditions in place to get to climate neutrality in the most cost-effective way. Great. And Daniel, over to you for last words. I don't think there's anything simple um, about climate change. So I think the challenge will be um, also a bit looking at the, the question that was in the Q&A, kind of how do we bring the long-term perspective and the short-term perspective together? And, and how actually do we find solutions that can convince people um, that taking action now is actually going to be beneficial for the future and that we prevent kind of the inequality that is in our current society to lead to status quo and to lead actually to much greater inequalities in the future. I think that's kind of a challenge that we all face. Many thanks again. Um, I have to apologize, of course, for being not perfectly in time, but uh... Indeed, this was a very dense uh, topic. We will uh, keep uh, you all in the loop. We will uh, keep working in particular on this question that uh, Wendell just mentioned, the social dimension of the energy transition, how actually to allow uh, households, citizens, businesses to really benefit directly from the energy transition on our pathway towards net zero. So stay tuned. We will keep you in the loop. Uh, we will be back uh, next month uh, um, from uh, the Brussels office to present our new action plan for 100% renewables. Um, look at our website to read uh, Vendel's excellent uh, analysis uh, to uh, find your way through all the numbers and figures towards 2040. Thank you for, uh, for the time and see you soon. Um, have a nice evening. Bye bye.